Welcome to the Economic Club of Florida's 569th meeting in our continuing series of distinguished speaker programs. My name is Marion Hoffman, and I have the pleasure of serving as your club's president. Um, I now hereby call this meeting to order, and if you'll please silence your cell phones that we are uninter uninterrupted. And now stand for the Pledge of Allegiance with me, if you would. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you. Welcome again. We have an exciting program for you all today. Our speaker is Katie Yader, president of the Florida Safety Council, and she's addressing us in June, which happens to be Safety Month. Katie also serves as the Chief Operating Officer and Chief Financial Officer for the Florida Chamber of Commerce. And our very own Economic Club board member, President Jim Murdahl, is here today, and he will be introducing Katie in just a few moments. Now, some information about our upcoming speaker program in July, and we're aiming for late July. We are working hard at putting together a panel on NIL, name, image, and likeness. This is a new NCAA policy that is absolutely changing the world of college athletics. It has huge financial impacts, not only for athletes, but for states and institutions. So please pay close attention to your ECHO newsletter and your email alerts because we will be um, distributing soon the exact date and place, but it is likely to be here at the FSU Alumni Center. Then in August, we're pleased to have Lassa Pedersen as our featured speaker at the Dunlock Championship Club. Mr. Pedersen is the CEO and president of Great Lakes Dredge and Dock Company. Great Lakes is a public company based in Houston, and it's the largest provider of dredging services in the United States, and it supports seaports and harbors around the country. And I wanna thank Doug Wheeler, who was a great help on our board bringing this company to us. Um, this company plays a critical role in beach renourishment projects, and it was recently announced that Great Lakes is the recipient of two major dredging awards, totaling $176 million, and it includes the Freeport Channel Improvement Project, and it's one of the first capital projects to be awarded by the U.S. Army Corps of Engineers in 2023. Now, just a reminder to please go to our Economic Club website, your one-stop shop, All Things Economic Club, and you can find past podcasts, you can find information about our speakers, and the Economic Club's also on LinkedIn, Facebook, and Twitter. And at this time, I would like to recognize our trustees. As you know, our trustees provide additional financial support to the club, and they in turn receive exclusive benefits for receptions with our speakers, and they get to ask some questions. So just today, we had a reception with Katie, and I think our trustees really enjoyed it. So if you're a trustee member, would you please stand for a moment and be recognized? Thank you. We also have a number of guests today and several from the Florida Chamber of Commerce. So I'm gonna go around. I wanna start right there in the front table with Mark Wilson with our guest. And Mark, if you would stand please and recognize the guest at that table. Thanks for having us today, Florida Chamber. Appreciate being here. Uh, I've got, uh, I've got Aaron Rachel, uh, Lauren, um, Megan with us today with the Florida Chamber team. Thanks for having uh, Frank and Katie here as well. We all, we all live here, we love this area, we love Florida. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Any more guests? If you'd raise your hand. Okay. Yep. Please. Very good. Thank you. Thank you. 
And I brought a guest, Stephen Babin. Stephen, stand for a moment. He's a recent graduate of Florida State University, and he's done a lot of work in emergency management. Do you want to say anything, Stephen? Sure. It's great to see everybody. Uh, thank you for the work you all do. And thanks for being here. Thank you for your, your, your patriotism and your enthusiasm for building a better topic for all of us. Thank you. Thank you. And we are proud to now have 45 new, get, new, new members that have joined. A lot of them were guests. Um, so if you have any interest or have guests that want to come, just let us know. Um, now I'm going to introduce the head table. And if you'd hold your applause so that we can go right through it and um, we can clap at the end. Beginning on my far right, your left, we have Ms. Heidi Otway. Heidi is the president of Salter Mitchell PR, a communications consultancy focused on helping good causes win. Decades of experience has solidified Heidi as an expert in all aspects of media, communications, marketing, and audience engagement. She has led numerous public relations and public affairs initiatives, managed the reputation of top corporate corporations and develop campaigns targeting diverse stakeholders across Florida. And I always like to have a fun fact about our special guests. The fun fact about Heidi is before switching to public relations, Heidi was a member of the Florida Capitol Press Corps, and she later chased hurricanes and tornadoes to provide live shots and video for TV stations across the country. So I like that about her. <laughs> Joshua is next. Joshua Walters grew up in Melbourne, Florida and moved to Tallahassee four years ago for work. He's a partner at Manasseh Shaw Firm, specializing in commercial litigation and real estate transaction. He's a member of Leadership Tallahassee's Class 38, and he was one of the top 20 under 40 by Leadership Tallahassee. And a big fun fact about Josh is when he went to the University of Florida, he was a Gator cheerleader. So I think Booter's going to like that. <laughs> and next we have Frank Walker. Frank serves as Executive Vice President of Government and Political Relations for the Florida Chamber of Commerce. In his role, Frank leads the Chamber's extensive legislative and political operations. Prior to the Chamber, Mark, uh, Frank spent over a decade in Washington serving two members of Congress, two U.S. Senators, and a governor of Florida. He has two quick fun facts. Immediately after graduating from college, Frank moved to Japan, where he taught English for a year as part of the Japan Exchange and Teaching Program, and Frank played on the Davidson College golf team and had a scratch handicap. Pretty cool. And then we have Dr. Jim Murdahl. He was named the sixth president of Tallahassee Community College in October of 2010. His personal vision is to make Tallahassee Community College the choice for students, the employer of choice for faculty and staff, and the partner of choice in the community. You all know Dr. Myrtle has a large resume and he serves on many boards. Some of them include he's chair of the Council of Presidents, the director and sustaining member of the Economic Club. He's a board member of the Florida Technology Council and he's a trustee for the Florida Chamber Foundation. Um, Jim, this is the fun fact about Jim and I've known him a long time, never knew this. Jim worked his way through college full-time as a locksmith. So we got to talk to you about that. And then finally, because our, our speaker will be introduced in a moment, we have Mr. Ken Botwell. Ken has spent much of his career in private business. He co-founded with his son, Jeff, and currently serves as the co-manager of Vineyard Capital Partners, a national private equity investment firm with private businesses in 17 states. And he was just telling me today that I think you're one of the top five in Tallahassee and one of the top in the Southeast, so I was very proud. He also served for 31 years as CEO of MGT of America, a national management consulting research firm with offices in Florida, California, Washington, Texas, and Michigan. And he is a co-founder and serves as chairman of the board of Capital Health Plan. Now this one, if you'll just allow me for one second, because it's a plug for Tallahassee, is Ken's fun fact. He said that he owes his fantastic life in Tallahassee to his late wife, Jean. Ken grew up on a dairy farm in Mississippi and planned to return to the farm upon graduation of college. 
While he and Jean were still dating, Jean informed Ken that she had no plans to spend the rest of her life milking cows. So Ken changed his college major from dairy husbandry to economics. Upon completing his military service, he was given two job offers, one from the University of Florida and one from Michigan State. When visiting Michigan State in April, the snow was blowing and it was cold. And Jean said to him, you can come here if you want to, but I'm going to Florida. <laughs> so later, Ken was recruited by the Presidential Search Committee of the University of uh, New York at Plattsburgh. And Jean's reaction was, are you kidding me? So he said he agrees with Jean that there's no better place in the world than to live in Tallahassee. So thank you for indulging me. This is our great head table. A round of applause, please. And you know, our sponsors are the lifeblood of the Economic Club. And we want to just thank the Florida Chamber again for being a sponsor. And if you have an interest in sponsorship, see any members of the board. And now I want to invite Frank Walker to provide greetings on behalf of the Chamber. Well, thank you, Mary. And it's so nice to be here. My name is Frank Walker. Uh, that fun fact about the scratch handicap for any golfers in the room, getting any ideas about meeting me on the first tee, I will tell you that two children does not equal two strokes. That is for certain. So, um, well, thank you, Marion, for the introduction. And thank you all for the Economic Club for having us here. We're pleased to sponsor our luncheon. Uh, I'm going to dive right in real quick and give you seven numbers rapid fire before I turn it over to Jim to introduce Katie. Um, everything that we do at the Florida Chamber is about uniting the business community to secure Florida's future. And all of these numbers are relevant to that underlying mission. So number one, 16, 16. If Florida was its own country, we would be the 16th largest economy in the world, larger than Turkey, larger than Saudi Arabia, nipping on the heels of Mexico. By the time we get to 2030, our underlying mission is to be top 10. That would be bigger than South Korea. Our second number, 18.2%. So juxtapose what I just said with this sobering reality. 18.2% of all children in Florida are growing up in poverty right now. 19.2% of Leon County children are growing up in poverty. One of the poorest zip codes in our state is right down the street at 32304. And thanks to the leadership of people like Dr. Murdoch and TCC, who have adopted that zip code, the business community is uniting behind efforts to try and eradicate the disease of poverty. Our third number, 46. If you were to rank Florida's legal climate before this legislative session, we would be 46th in the country, bottom five. Talked to my good friend, Kevin Vaughn earlier, some significant steps by the legislature. I think we're gonna see that improve over the coming years. Our fourth number, 53%. So think about that poverty number and what would be some of those drivers of poverty in our communities. Only 53% of third graders in Florida are reading on grade level. That means almost half are not. Leon County is no exception. 52% of, of Leon County children are reading at grade level in third grade. If you wanna know how your school stacks up, go to the Florida Gap Map on the Chamber website. We've actually drilled down at the school level so you can tell exactly how each and every school is doing around our state. Why do third grade reading scores matter? That's the nexus of when children stop learning to read and begin reading to learn. And frankly, that's our future workforce that is in development at that early of an age. Our fifth number, 61. So for every 61 unemployed people in Florida, there are 100 open jobs. In Leon County, for every 37 unemployed people, there are 100 open jobs. Now, if Florida is creating one out of every 11 jobs nationally, that's extraordinary economic momentum but it also shows that we have a workforce gap that needs to be filled. It's why investing in things like our number one ranked state university and state college system are so important as we build out the workforce of tomorrow. Our sixth number, and we jump up big here, two and a half million. We have two and a half million drivers that will be joining our roads by 2030. Now, I say that as a explanation of the challenge and opportunity that comes with our growth. Two and a half million more drivers. That means also an extraordinary new strain on our water systems, our electric grid, our telecommunications systems, our resiliency, and our housing. Um, all of these can be opportunities if prepared for appropriately today or challenges tomorrow. And then my final number is 4.48 million. 
So if you can imagine over the time since we've walked in those doors, broke bread, sat down and started, about an hour has passed and $4.48 million worth of wealth has migrated into this state. That's three and a half times as much has migrated into Texas, who's number two. And Florida, if you add up the second through the 10th largest states for wealth migration, beats them all by itself. We all know a thousand people are moving here a day, but they're voting not just with their feet, but with their pocketbooks. With that wealth comes extraordinary opportunity. So everything that we do, like I said, comes back to competitiveness. In our 2030 blueprint that our founders laid out in the foundation several years ago, a multi-year, multi-million dollar project, set out 39 goals. And we measure our progress towards those goals with the Florida scorecard. Now, thanks to Wayne Huizenga and a overnighted million dollar check several years ago, all of that data I just shared is free and available to the entire public on the website, the Florida scorecard, scorecard.org. In addition, you can drill down to the county level. If what is worth doing is worth measuring, let's at least all start on the same page for the opportunities and the metrics that matter in our state. So now uh, I'm gonna turn it over to Jim and Marion, and I appreciate again the opportunity uh, to join you all for lunch and everything you do for our city. Thank you. Thank you, Frank. We appreciate you and everything you and the chamber do uh, for our community and our state. So I get the privilege to introduce today a remarkable leader and a remarkable person in our state uh, that is doing really, really important work during this very special month. So let me tell you a little bit about Katie Yader. She's a CEO and CFO of the Florida Chamber of Commerce and president of the Florida Chamber Leadership Cabinet on safety, health, and sustainability. Katie's dual focused perspective as a leader promotes member education and spearheads action to achieve enterprise results. Her drive to envision and actualize new possibilities to fuel organizational growth and continuous improvement has remained a constant throughout her career and her life. She's a six time full distance Ironman finisher, two time half Ironman finisher, who also summited Mount Kilimanjaro. Katie never stops striving for excellence in everything she does. And in 2022, Influence Magazine named her one of their most influential people in Florida politics. She's an active member of the Young Presidents Organization, a global leadership community of over 30,000 leaders in 142 countries. And she was recently accepted into the Harvard Kennedy School Leaders Program. Bill Yergin, CEO of Florida's Correct Craft, says Katie Yader is one of a kind leader. She exhibits strong intuition and strategic skills while also driving excellent operational results. She holds herself to a high standard while motivating her team to reach their potential. Any organization would be better with Katie. Katie has spearheaded bold new initiatives that have led to year after year record-breaking revenue results for the Florida Chamber, while expanding the Chamber's ability to help make Florida one of the nation's safe, safest, healthiest, and most sustainable states. She leads internal operations and strategic planning for a parent organization of 17 nonprofit and for-profit entities, including the Safety Council, the Health Council, and the Sustainability Council. She oversees financial management, revenue generation, accounting, and human resources across the Florida Chamber. She created the leadership cabinet structure and operations from the Florida Safety Council, building motivated teams and policies to strengthen the organization's ability to meet key performance indicators. She built an advisory board of senior executives from Disney, Coca-Cola, Advent Health, and other global industry leaders, and she created a robust educational division featuring a national leadership webinar series, including a 30 hour OSHA sanctioned training program, mental health awareness workshops for HR professionals, and an internal chamber university to provide employee training opportunities, career pathing and coaching. She also developed the Florida Leadership Conference on Safety, Health and Sustainability featuring high profile industry expert speakers with over 600 business leaders participating over the course of the three years. 
And I could go on, folks, but she obviously has a lot of time on her hands to come and speak to the Economic Club of Florida. Uh, with that, would you please give a great Economic Club of Florida welcome to Katie Yeager. I'm up here. <laughs> now, thank you so much, Jim, for that introduction. Thank you, Marion. Thank you, trustees and members, for having me here with you today. I've been here actually three years. I left Wisconsin, grew up a farm girl, much like Ken did, you know, milking the cows. And the weather is much nicer in Florida than it is in, in Wisconsin. So thank you so much for having uh, me today. I'm very excited to talk to you about the opportunity um, behind safety, health, and sustainability and why this has become a priority for the Florida business um, community. As you heard, Frank, and I don't mean to repeat some of these numbers, but um, the Florida Chamber um, is strategize behind uniting business for good to secure Florida's future. And as you heard Frank talk about going from the 16th largest economy to 10th largest economy by 2030. And that is the 2030 blueprint by the Florida Chamber Foundation. That is all lined behind those 39 goals that Frank talked about that's all measured through our scorecard and our zip code level data. Um, so again, not to be repetitive of Frank, um, 2.9 million net new residents, 1.4 million net new jobs, 40 million more annual visitors and 2.5 million more drivers on the road. So to grow the right way and make sure that the right things are happening in Florida, given the growth that we're going to see in those areas. Um, the, the one goal that I'm going to focus on today to talking about of those 39 is becoming the top, top five state um, for well-being. currently number 20, um, but improving. And how we plan to accomplish that is through the Florida Chamber Leadership Cabinet on Safety, Health, and Sustainability, become the safest, healthiest, and most sustainable state in America, and most importantly, to set the standard for the nation on safety, health, and sustainability. Our Leadership Cabinet is comprised of 20 board members that are global leaders throughout the world on all things safety, health, and sustainability, many of which are not even located um, in, in Florida, but run global operations across the world. Um, our safety council is focused on making Florida the safest state in America, and that focuses on all of our tacti tactical safety trainings, our OSHA trainings, our fork out, lockout, tag out. Our Florida Chamber Health Council is focused on long-term systemic issues that if we don't start addressing, we won't be able to train out our way out of. Very focused on mental well-being, focused on our opioid epidemic, preventative health programs, and marijuana. And the Florida Chamber Sustainability Council, cleaner air, cleaner water, and cleaner, cleaner land. So I'm gonna share a lot of numbers and a lot of data. This is the Florida Economics Club after all. So to a comp, um, the Florida ranks currently 32nd um, in the US for lost time non-fatal worker comp claims per 1000 workers. This is an industry mix adjusted number putting every state on an equal playing field. So that puts us 32nd out of 50 states. Florida's estimated GDP loss from lost time claims, um, and this is most recent data of 2021. Lost time claims, we had 70,633 in 2021. Our average lost time days were eight, which is a national number. Average GDP per worker per day in Florida is costing us $519. And with the amount of workers in Florida in 2021, it was roughly 9.3 million. Lost GDP due to lost time claims were 293 million um, for the state of Florida. Now that number could be higher than 293 million because we now know 13% of workers do not return to work after a lost time injury, um, as well as making lower wages um, as well. So that number could actually be a lot, um, a lot bigger than what we have up there. Florida reported 52,852 non-COVID related worker comp claims in 2022, which is down from the 60,353 non-COVID related claims in 2021. The average cost for claims in Florida at a 30 month average maturity to account for the full length of care um, and service was 48,000, higher than the US median of 46,000. Florida is still trending at a higher rate against the median, which is going down at a rate about 2.4, meaning costs aren't coming down at the same rate as in other places. 
So Florida is coming down roughly at a 0.6. With the cost of all claims being higher, our total employer costs of workers comp per $100 of covered wages are higher as well. Florida is 78 cents per $100 of covered wages as opposed to the US average of 68 cents uh, per $100 of covered wages. Worker comp claims per thousand workers by industry. This is standardized by the size of industry um, to put it on a level playing field. Our top three uh, worker comp claims by thousand workers are mining, with second being transportation, warehousing, and utilities, and lastly, professional and business services. The graph there to the right, you can see the decline on the median of 2.4 um, and where Florida is declining at roughly 0.6. At 3.38, Florida work, workplace fatalities of per 100,000 workers over time, which we're measuring from 2011 to 2021, is under the national average of 3.41, but has been trending up over time from 2011. Florida had 315 workplace fatalities in 2021, up from the 275 in 2020. 2020, everybody, I think, you know, was very focused on workplace safety with the COVID impact, as well as a lot less people working. Um, and so we did see a decline in workplace fatalities in, in 2020. But we have surpassed 2019 fatality numbers of 306. Adjusted for industry mix, Florida ranks 42nd for workplace fatality rates out of 50. Workplace fatalities by one digit event, our top three are transportation, falls, slips, trips, and violence and injuries by persons or animals. So going back to when we talk about our 2030 blueprint and the additional drivers that we're gonna be having on the roads, we've kind of heard the term transportation come up several times now, both from a, a non-fatal as well as fatal um, standpoint. Florida workplace fatalities by two digit industry Top three, construction, administrative and waste services. An important note there is that does include landscaping and transportation and warehousing. When we adjust for the industry size per 1,000 workers to create um, equilibrium on that, the average annual workplace fatalities adjust, and agriculture and forestry are now our number one, construction number two, and transportation and warehousing number three. There's been a lot of factors that we could maybe contribute to some of those increases and where we rate nationally on non-fatal workplace injuries as well as fatal workplace injuries. This slide I think says a lot to what can be going on in the workplace that's driving a lot of that data and information. On the top left there, you see unintended, you can't quite see it's very small, I'm so sorry. So unintended overdoses um, is on a dramatic upswing. And when you look at Florida age-adjusted drug overdoses, that includes intentional and unintentional, but 90% of that is unintentional. What's also important to note on those two graphs, when we say unintentional overdoses, that number, those are actually happening in the workplace and while people are on the job. So that does not account for outside of the workplace. But then we can also see opioid prescription rates per 100 people over time is at an all-time low from 2006. So if we're, if we're going to accomplish being the safest, we can go into organizations, we can teach OSHA, we can teach training and lockout tagouts, you know, restraints, six feet or above on OSHA. But if we don't address the long-term systemic issues that we just talked about, we can never get to safest, right? So we have to start addressing some of the long-term systemic issues that are driving a lot of the data on our safety side. Mental well-being big, being one, opioids, which we just saw the data behind that. Um, as well as preventative health programs um, and, and marijuana. So to create the impact and move the needle on this, we very recently in, in May, to respond to the need, we launched the Florida Chamber Health Council under the Florida Chamber Leadership Cabinet, which is our new business-led mental health, mental wellness um, initiative. Um, we've brought Dr. Navy um, Bob um, onto the team to lead this, uh, this initiative underneath the Leadership Cabinet. So first looking at really the national perspective um, on the mental health crisis right now. One in five US adults experience mental illness. One in 20 US adults experience serious mental illness. 17% of youth 16 to 17 experience a mental health disorder. Depression and anxiety disorders are currently costing the global economy a trillion dollars each year in lost productivity. 
Recently at our annual leadership conference on safety, health, and sustainability, we had a large focus on mental health, mental well-being. 85.2 of our survey respondents said they or know someone who has suffered from a mental health crisis. And it affects all ages. So in U.S. adolescents, which will be 12 to 17, one in six experienced a major depressive episode. Three million had serious thoughts of suicide. 31% increase in mental health-related emergency department visits. In young adults, which categorizes as 18 to 25, one in three experienced a mental health illness, one in 10 experienced a serious mental illness, and 3.8 million had serious thoughts of suicide. It is the leading cause of death in the U.S., second among people ages 10 to 14, third among people aged 15 to 24, and 12th overall. So where is Florida when compared to where we are in a national landscape? Right now, Florida ranks 49th in the U.S. for access to care for mental health. We have three, 633 untreated adults, 116 untreated youth, and 1,343 Floridians waiting for help. The U.S. Census Bureau has started doing a household pulse survey every year since COVID. Feelings of nervousness, anxiousness are on the edge, 59%. Not being able to stop or control worrying, 51%. Little interest or pleasure in doing things, 49%. And you can read that, but, but you get the point. Why does this matter, right? If 59% of Floridians are feeling nervous, anxious, or on the edge, those are those individuals that make up our workforce. They're coming into our organizations and we're expecting them to have high productivity, be good members of the team, focused on what they're doing and most importantly, keeping themselves safe and keeping their team members safe at the same time. <laughs> A patient with major depressive disorder, we'll call it MDD, missed 6.97 days of work more than a non-MDD patient. Depression interferes with a person's ability to complete a physical job task about 20% of the time and reduces cognitive performance about 35% of the time. When you look in it, I apologize, it's so small, but the top left chart there will show you the top line um, is somebody, a non-MDD and the bottom line um, is MDD. That difference is about 6.3%. Right, the estimate of Florida, Florida adults um, with MDD is 1.4 million. If we address that gap of 6.3%, we will add 89,000 full-time workers back into the workforce. And so as you heard from Frank, we talk about workforce, workforce shortage, getting more people into our economy, into our organizations to address that. Here's an opportunity that we can, we can utilize to, to help move the economy forward in Florida. So to continue to advance our statewide business led mental health initiative, we will be leading an independent, nonpartisan, data-driven, and trusted policy program that creates systemic changes so all people can obtain effective, efficient behavioral health care when and where they need it. And we will be addressing that through key stakeholders guided by seven strategic principles, which are listed up, uh, up above. Improve state and federal level policy, develop local behavioral health systems, improve university leadership capacity for mental and brain health, help funders of care implement best practices, change public awareness to improve access to effective care, identify, share, and promote outcome-driven strategies to the population level best practices to scale for children, veterans, smart justice, and critical needs across lifespan, and advance health equity to reduce mental health disparities. This is what our current mental health care system looks like. It very much addresses it in a very separate and siloed approach. How we're addressing the physical side is very much separate from how we're addressing it from the mental wellness, mental health side. So you're living your life, right? We go to work, we go to home, we have school, we've got kids. The healthcare is addressing really those physical needs side of things. The primary care, the secondary care, inpatient care. <laughs> right, best practices anchors. On the mental health care, a lot of that then happens through when it gets to the point of crisis. We're seeing that come through in law enforcement, ER hospital visits, and jail, uh, and our corrections um, institutions. And then from there, it's a very fragmented care on specialty care, primary care, and best practice um, boutique, but are handled in very much a segre segregated and separate, separate way. The ideal system to which we are going to be working to achieve in Florida to get better outcomes 
um, for all Floridians, this is the ideal mental health care system. So whether we're talking about work, we're talking about school, being um, at home, kids, health care, mental health care, integrate and is part of whole person care as opposed to two separate and distinct issues being dealt with. So on the specialty care side, we have outpatient rehabilitation, inpatient, best practice, anchor, and it's the same on the mental health care, but they're handled very much in concert with one another in our everyday lives as opposed to separate and distinct. And finally, our Fuller Chamber Leadership Cabinet is our business-led initiative around cleaner air, cleaner water, and cleaner land. We're going to continue to dig deeper into this. These are some preliminary numbers that the board has been working around to how can we better partner with organizations and businesses to really move the needle on all things sustainability in the state from being a good steward um, of our environmental resources um, and moving the needle um, on, on sustainability. So with that, um, I guess I will open it up for questions, Marion. <laughs> Any questions from the audience? Okay. Well, first of all, thank you for an outstanding presentation. As a psychologist who's worked in a psychiatric hospital for 32 years, we have all known this. And I really want to do a shout out to the Florida Chamber uh, to, for taking this on and recognizing how critical this is as we move forward in making sure that we have the best prepared and the most productive uh, citizens that we possibly can. What, you know, Florida has always tried to get by on the cheap when it comes to mental health. Mm -hmm. As you said in your statistics, we're number 49. Yep. What do you see as the major challenges in helping us to change that? We cannot stay at 49 if we're going to make meaningful impact dealing with mental health. Absolutely. No, thank you so much for that. And your name was? Your name? Larry. Larry. Thank you so much for, for the question. And, you know, so all of this, again, comes back to what Frank talks about and the vision of what Mark has done at the Florida Chamber around our 2030 blueprint goals, right? If we want to move to the 10th largest economy by 2030, right, this is absolutely a component that we have to address. A lot of this is going to come through on those seven strategic priorities. So I don't have a direct answer for you at this time, you know, would love to welcome you into that work that we're doing to get input from you on how we're asking the right questions, first of all, to get to the right solutions. Part of this work that we're doing, we're working with a national policy institute um, firm that is going to help us move this forward. So they've done a lot of this work in Texas currently. They've moved tremendous um, efforts in Texas and improved the outcomes and the impact in Texas. So what we're doing is we're trying to look at what has worked in other states and then looking at how those types of principles have worked that can be applied to Florida. And then what does Florida have to do from the uniqueness of who we are right, to continue to move that. So what we're going to be looking at is how is this totally, this mental wellness system for outcomes being funded, both from a state level, a federal level, um, and across the board. And so we'll be looking at all of that structural component to this, not only how is it set up and how um, Floridians move through the system, all the way down to schools, as well as when you get up you know, further, we went through all age groups, right? And so how is the state currently set up and trying to address this problem? How is the insurance industry trying to address this problem? And then you've got the healthcare sector trying to address the problem. And then you have the schools, right? Also, you know, in the mix here, right? So it's a, it's a big task, right? And so spot on, Larry, that's exactly the question we're trying to answer, right? And what we're gonna do is get all of those stakeholders around the table to figure out how it's currently set up and then how do you make it better, right? To ultimately get better outputs, right? So Larry, I'll be calling you, but looking forward to working with you on this because we certainly don't have all the answers yet. <laughs> uh, this is to kind of piggyback off Larry. I had a, a very personal experience with this. Two months ago, I walked out of St. John's Church on a Sunday to the parking lot and I had 40 mile. 45, 50 minute conversation with someone who was clearly experiencing what mm -hmm. I would term mental distress. And I was completely powerless, mm -hmm. right? Because if somebody has a broken leg, you drive them to TOC, right? Um, if, if they're hungry, you take them to Whole Foods and get them food. I had no clue what to do. And, and everybody had left the church. Do you call the police? You don't know what to do. And, and I have had conversations with a few of you and others in town it was an eye-opening experience because you literally 
have no clue how to even approach this, right? Mm -hmm. How do you, how do we think about working with businesses and, and people across the state of what resources are in place to actually, when there is a crisis, do something? Because, you know, I, I pretty resourceful person and, and my Eagle Scout training didn't, didn't do anything, <laughs> right? Oh, thank you. Thank you for that question. Your name was? Blake. Blake. Yep. Um, no, thank you for that question. And I think, you know, the situation we're in right now, we have to address the short term immediate tactics for people that are suffering or need help, right? As well as addressing the long term system how, on how we're going to get better long term outcomes through this, right? And so right now we have to work up and down that spectrum. And so through the health council, uh, one of our board members actually is Chief Carl Metzger. Uh, he is the chief of police at UCF. Sorry, Chris, not UF, um, at um, UCF, right? And he has seen um, three suicides in the last six or eight months, and that's never happened at his tenure at UCF. And so working with Navy Bob, who's leading our health council, we're going to be putting some immediate trainings into the workplace um, that we're working with some experts on, on how we can equip people to have those basic conversations um, when you come into those you know, situations when you come out of church, right? And so we have to kind of address all the way up the, the, be able to identify at what point of crisis they're in, right? Is this just a conversation that you can help them or do you need to actually seek some sort of crisis intervention immediately, right? And so we have to better equip people to understand that, recognize that and identify that. Uh, we're working with Chief Metzger. There are trainings for that that we'll get certified in um, to be able to offer that, those types of things um, immediately. We're also working with Dr. Carolyn Leaf. Um, if you haven't um, heard of her, she has been a neuroscientist for over 40 years. She's from South Africa. She's partnering with us on this initiative to offer some of those trainings um, right out of the gate here um, very, very quickly. So she's written a, a lot of literature. She wrote Cleaning Up Your Mental Mess. Um, and I think when you hear Carolyn and Dr. Leaf speak, right, it's very empowering to hear that it's okay to be a mess, right? And when you give people that 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 permission, I don't know if that's the right word, right? To say, you know, it's okay not to be okay, right? And, you know, mental health, mental wellness is a condition of being human, right? So it doesn't no matter, everybody deals with it. We all have levels of trauma, whether it's a one or whether it's a 10. Everybody in, in this room has been through a level of trauma. If you were alive and around on this earth in 2020 and we were going through COVID, there was some degree of trauma with that. It may have been a one, Right. If you know, if it was just you were worried about uncertainty of the schools and your kids and and all of that, it wasn't maybe a direct impact that you could say, but it was uncertainty. Right. And uncertainty is toxic. We can call that trauma. And then you have all the way up to a level of 10 where, you know, you couldn't be with a loved one in the hospital when they they passed away. Right. So I think we can start having these conversations by creating an equal playing field for everybody. And I think without having people to be so vulnerable about very personal stories, we can start with saying we've all had trauma. Now, how do you deal with trauma? Because we've all been through COVID. Right. And so very excited to work with Dr. Leaf on this. You know, she very much believes in um, mind brain connection um, and how we go about, you know, connecting the mind, the brain and the body. And so if you train your mind, it can affect your brain through the neurocycle pathways, which can get you better um, emotional reactions as well as physical ailments that can come through um, a mental wellness. But one of the things that we'll be doing the trainings, we're actually gonna be doing a public documentary series with um, um, PBS actually. Um, um, I'm going to, to create awareness around this. I'm gonna be swimming while well, attempting to, I'll knock on wood now here if that's right. Um, the English Channel um, next July, and we're going to be using that to talk about how you train your mind, right? To train your body to, to get, you know, physical outcomes. And so we'll be working with some of the best and the brightest minds on how you train your mind and you overcome things and you build resiliency, right? And so that's, um, that's one avenue. But that was a really long, Blake, answer to your question. <laughs> Hopefully it answered it. <laughs> Oh. And let's give a, and let's on behalf of the economic club, we present this to Katie and thank you all again for coming and please be on the lookout for July and come in August as well. So there thank you, Mary. We are adjourned. Thank you.